What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the channel. I am your grateful host, Jeff Rose. We're doing something different, something new here on the channel, on the podcast. And this is a new series I'm calling the Wealthy OG. And basically the whole point of this series is I wanna give back. I wanna share some of the experiences that have allowed me to achieve the wealthy status that I have right now. Because I know many of you are like me where I was 10, 20, maybe even 30 years ago, where you want to get rich, you, you want to amass some sort of wealth, you want to achieve financial freedom, you just don't know where to start. You just don't know how to begin. So when I really start thinking about like, what has been my wealth building journey? Like what are, were the steps? What were some of the key ingredients? Like what are the things that I, had to do to get where I'm at today. And when I started analyzing and looking at my own situation, I recognized like there were some key accounts, there were some key aspects of my wealth building journey that allowed me to get where I'm at today. And that's what I want to share with you right now. And what I'm calling this, this is called the wealth stack. So these are seven different items that I opened, that I accumulated, that I started along the way. Now, some of these are accounts that you can actually go and open today. Others are, we'll call them entities or assets or properties that may take some time depending on where you're at in your journey. So before we share what the wealth stack is, First, the thing that you have to have, and this is something that may be hard for some of you. I don't know why it was easier for me. I don't know if I just had nothing to lose, but the one thing that I had at the beginning was the ability to allow my mindset to change. And that, that's a big deal because many of you are stuck in this fixed or growth mindset. And if you don't know what that is, I encourage you to check out a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. I believe the uh, subtitle is The Psychology of Success. And that is a book that really, it really helped develop my thinking and looking at the difference between a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And this has also been referred to as a broke mindset versus an abundant mindset. And you know, some of the key differences between the two is looking at challenges or obstacles. Because if you have like a fixed mindset or a broke mindset, you don't like challenges. You don't like obstacles. So if those things come up, you, you freeze. Or they don't even come up because you avoid them. You do everything that you can to make sure that these challenges or obstacles don't come up. Now you compare this to somebody that has a growth or an abundant mindset. And this is where I, I would put myself. I love challenges. Like I love obstacles. Like I love things coming up that push me, that challenge me, that basically put me to the brink where it's like, okay, 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 you, you challenge, you obstacle, whatever the heck you are. I'm not gonna let you ruin me. I'm gonna show you what's up. I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and we're gonna get to work. So I love challenges. I love obstacles. And that's just something, it's just how either I'm wired to something with my upbringing, which is not really looking at my parents because I can definitely say that both my parents had a fixed or a broke mindset. So this is something that I gained along the way but your mindset is important. You have to have the right mindset. Robert Kiyosaki had this to say about mindset. He said that your mindset matters. If you don't have the mindset of a wealthy person, how can I afford it versus somebody that is poor who says or asks, I can't afford it, you will never achieve wealth. And that is really a big difference, like the way that he breaks down like those two questions is how can I afford it versus I can't afford it. And when I look at my own business and the things I've been able to achieve, 
you know, it didn't become, man, I can't make a million dollars. It became, how can I make a million dollars? What do I need to do? What are the steps that I need to take? What are the things in the business that I need to do? Who are the people that I need to hire? What are the things that I need to stop doing and outsourcing and delegating? And this did not happen overnight, like not even close. You know, this is a process over time that I was able to adopt. But the whole key of having a wealthy mindset is just the willingness to change, the willingness to believe in yourself. And, and that is a big deal. So before you start down this wealth stack journey, you got to believe in yourself. In yourself. You have to believe that your current situation is not the future. A quote that I love by Dan Sullivan is, you know, your, your past, make your future bigger than your past. Stop living, looking in the rear view mirror. We want to reflect on things that happen, but like they don't define who we are today. That's a big deal. All right. So first thing first, you got to have the mindset. You got to have the mindset. So now let's look at the very first key ingredient of this well stack. So number one is a CYA fund. Uh, and that does not stand for see ya, wouldn't want to be a no, a cover your beep fund, cover your butt fund. Some people refer to this as an emergency fund. And this is as a financial planner, like this is what I thought of a, a CYA fund, but you got to cover your butt. You got to cover your butt in case something happens because life is going to happen. And when I look back at my wealth building journey. I, I mean, I can remember I was a financial advisor for almost two years. And prior to that, like I didn't have a savings account. Like all I had was a checking account. And the way that I was able to, to know what my balance was in that checking account was anytime I went to the ATM and took money out, I'd get the receipt and it would show me how much money I had. That whole process like did not work very well. I, I bounced a few checks. I had uh, a few overdraft <laughs> withdrawals where I had to pay the $30, $40 fee to the bank and usually had to pay you know, the, the merchant, whoever uh, I was paying. That's not good. That's not good. So it wasn't actually being deployed to Iraq until I finally <laughs> started, opened my first savings account. That was with my wife at the time. We, we got married right before I deployed to Iraq. I tell you what, it's been, oh my goodness, over 20 years since that happened. You know, four kids later, several businesses later, I can sit here and tell you that life happens. Crap happens. It happens. And having that cash in that CYA fund, one, it gives you freedom, freedom of stress, freedom of anxiety, freedom from just worrying about, man, how am I gonna pay for this? How am I gonna pay for that? Your car is gonna break down. Something's gonna happen with your house. You're gonna have a medical emergency. I mean, this is just how life works. It just works this way. And, you know, we did follow like the Dave Ramsey $1,000 uh, $1, emergency fund. Like that was like our baby step one. Is that his baby first baby step? I think it is. That was our baby step, you know, get to a thousand. After that, it was to get to 5,000. And really from there, like as the income has grown, we have increased like how much we have in our CYA fund. You absolutely need it. I, and I see people, especially right now, in this time frame, the time of this recording, you know, you've got cryptocurrency going crazy. You got meme stocks going crazy. You got the stock market going crazy. So it is so tempting to pull money out of this CYA fund because like this fund ain't paying you nothing. I don't care what bank you have and where, what online bank you have. It's paying you 0, 0.0 whatever, nothing, 0, 0.00 nothing. The temptation is to go out and put money into, into Bitcoin. Temptation is to go out and put it into a, a meme stock. The temptation is to go out and open a, let's say like a BlockFi account, you know, that's paying you 8.6%. Even I won't do that with my CYA fund. That fund serves one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to protect 
myself, protect my family in case something happens and we need that money. So I don't wanna take any risk with that money. I wanna make sure that it is there, it is protected. And whenever I need it, I can go to my bank, I can go online wherever it is and pull it out. That's number one. The second thing that is crucial to the wealth stack is the Roth IRA. I love me some Roth IRA. I talk about the Roth IRA a lot. I've got some more videos coming up about the Roth IRA. So if you want to know more about this Roth IRA, then I suggest that you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, because I got more content about the Roth IRA, just updating this content and talking about one of the greatest investment tools that exists out there. And it's really important if you are watching this now and you're at the beginning stages of your wealth building journey that you go and open a Roth IRA because if you start following the steps, you start listening to what I'm talking about here on the channel, your income is going to go up. And the good news is that eventually you're going to make too much money that you can't participate and you can't do a Roth IRA because the IRS has these, they call them phase out limits. It basically says, oh, I'm sorry, you make too much money, so you can't take advantage of this amazing tax-free investment vehicle. It's one of those good problems to have. I haven't been able to put new money into a Roth IRA for a long while. I actually don't remember the last time I was able to make a contribution. Once again, one of those good problems to have where I just made too much money. But the good news is that I got money into my Roth. I was able to make some good investments and then my Roth IRA grew from, I think it was 11,000. I believe it was like $11,000 that I put in of my own money. And it's grown to be over 240, 250,000. I think the peak was 270 before a recent pullback on one of the investments that I shared in the previous video. And I'll have a link to that video if you wanna check that out in the description. But the beauty of this thing is that it's still sitting there, it's still growing, and it is 100% tax-free. I personally believe, and I have another video where I talk about this, I personally believe that opening the Roth, Roth IRA first before you do a 401k, even if you have a 401k at your job, is a better option. And the reason being is because opening a Roth IRA, you have to go do it. Like whether you go online on your computer, whether you go to a brick and mortar business and sit down with a financial professional, you have to go do it. And it forces you to do a little extra homework and have more of a vested interest in it Whereas a 401k, most 401ks I see are just really easy to set up, automatic, you just, they give you a form, you click, you know, check a few boxes, or maybe you do something online, click a few boxes and boom, oh yeah, I'm putting money in my 401k. And most people I see that do it that way, they have no idea what they have, they have no idea what they're investing into, they very seldom ever check it, if they do check it, the only thing they're looking at is like, oh, am I up, am I down, you know, what's the percentage, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do a lot of research. And the other reason why is with the Roth IRA, you have more options. You don't have to choose from this small menu option that your employer offers with your 401k choices. Like typically you're gonna see like eight to 12, maybe 15 choices in your 401k. As opposed to the Roth IRA, you can go and put anything, for the most part, anything that you want into it individual stocks, ETFs, mutual funds. You can even open up a self-directed Roth IRA, that's correct, and buy Bitcoin with it. Now that is beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Full transparency, I do not have any cryptocurrency currently in my Roth IRA, but it is something that is available to me and also to you. And that's why I love the Roth IRA. So I shared you know, with my Roth IRA holdings, You know, right now it's predominantly individual stocks. And because of that, I've been able to grow this thing a whole lot faster than me opening an account with say like Vanguard or even Fidelity and having a lifestyle fund, a target date fund. Yeah, it would have made me some money, but not nearly as much as I have now. So that's why I love the Roth, more control, more control. Maybe, I'm, maybe I got like some control issues, I don't know. But I love having control in what 
my money is going into and you should too. So that is number two. Number three, a personal equity fund. You may have heard the term private equity fund. Personal equity is we're talking about, and I'm sure you've heard this expression before, that you are your best investment. Invest into yourself. You cannot match the return that you get investing into yourself. And it's very cliche, but it's so true. But I know many of you like don't really understand that concept or they don't even know like how to start. So a personal equity fund is nothing special. You can open this, open this account at your bank. It could be an investment account, but essentially, you know, this is money that you are setting aside that is specific to investing in yourself, into your education, that can allow yourself to grow, to be better. What are some examples? I've shared this before in the podcast and also on the YouTube channel here, but investing into yourself. So this could be attending a conference. Maybe there's, there's a conference that you've always wanted to go to. It Maybe it's ran by a, a mentor of yours, or you just see uh, you know, high achieving influencers that attend this conference, but you've never given yourself permission to pay the money to do it. This is where that personal equity fund comes into play. You're putting money into this account so that when you see an opportunity that allows you to invest into yourself, like there's no, there's no guilt. There's like, man, where am I gonna get this money? I don't have the money. I can't afford going to this conference. Oh wait, I have this personal equity fund that I put away. I've got $500 in there. I'm going to attend that conference or I'm going to buy that course that I know like, oh man, my family, my friends are gonna make fun of me that I spent you know, $500 on this course that's gonna show me how to do YouTube or learn blogging or sell high ticket items, be a closer, all this good stuff. When you put this money away, you're giving yourself permission to invest into whatever that may be. And it doesn't have to be these high ticket items. Like you could start off, you know, one way investing yourself could be just reading books, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube channels. It could be joining a mastermind group, hiring a coach, whether it be a success coach, a business coach, a fitness coach. These are other ways that you can invest into yourself. These types of investments, what I would call, not so much the fitness side of things, but like income accelerators. You know, this is the coaching. This is the, the mastermind groups, the books, the podcasts, the courses, things that are going to give you experience and knowledge that you didn't have that should impact how much you can make and increase how much you make much faster. I like to call these the income accelerators. So you can earmark some money in this personal equity fund that once again gives you permission to invest into yourself. So that is number three, having this personal equity fund. Number four is what I would call a trading or a alternate investment account. After I record this, I may come up with a better name for it. I believe the way that I love to learn is through trial and error. I love just diving in and that's how I learn. I mean, I wouldn't really suggest this, you know, like learning to swim, like by just diving in, you know, and trying to figure it out, especially like in the deep end. That's not a good way to learn. But as far as like learning how to invest, my belief is based on my experience, I learned by opening an account and buying my first investment, which was a mutual fund. And then I bought a stock. Actually, maybe I bought a stock first, I forget. And it probably was a stock I didn't make any money on. But that's how I learned. Like I could, I can, I can go watch YouTube videos and that's a good way to learn. You can read books, you can listen to podcasts, you can go buy a course, you can go sit up lunch with somebody that's an experienced investor. But for me, I gotta get my hands dirty. And for me to get my hands dirty in this way is going and opening an account. So that's how I learned how to invest initially. And even recently, this is how I learned. By opening up a, what was the first account? Was it Coinbase or BlockFi? I think it was Coinbase. I hadn't bought any cryptocurrency at all. And I'm thinking, man, like, okay. I, I've been putting this off for a long time. What do I need to do? Well, how do I how do I learn? Okay, let me just open an account and let me put a thousand dollars into Bitcoin. Like that's how I learned. 
you know, for me, a thousand dollars is not a lot of money. If that were to go to nothing, I, I would not lose sleep over that. My wife would not make me sleep on the couch over that. Like that is not a big deal. So I started off with a much smaller amount. Same thing with, actually, I keep saying this. I'm thinking of other examples. You know, this is how I learned how Betterment works. I opened an account to see, you know, how their ETF models work. This is how I learned about peer-to-peer -peer lending with Lending Club. I opened an account with Lending Club and started picking notes. This is how I learned about Fundrise, open an account with Fundrise, investing, choosing my different real estate investment strategies. I learned with BlockFi. Um, it's how I learned even with my business, you know, starting a blog was not reading a book, not buying a course, was buying a domain and then figuring out how WordPress works. A little bit off topic, but I think you get the idea. Opening a trading account. So initially, this could be just a, an account with say Robinhood, M1 Finance, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, Ally Invest. I don't, I don't care where it is, but the idea is that you're opening an account and then you're buying an investment. Not a big amount. You don't wanna like put everything that you own and, and buy some stock or mutual fund or ETF, but you're just going through this process of learning how to invest. And hopefully you've already learned a little bit because you, if you're following these steps in order, you've already opened the Roth IRA. So then in addition to that, if you want to learn how other investments work, you know, that's where you would open a, an account with Coinbase. If you want to learn more about cryptocurrency, could also be BlockFi, or, and there's tons of others. If you want to learn about real estate, you want you could open a, an account with Fundrise, Realty Mogul. Uh, if you want to learn about, um, can't really do peer-to-peer -peer lending anymore because Lending Club kind of changed their business model, but Prosper, if they are in your state, you could open a Prosper account to learn about peer-to-peer -peer lending. That is how you learn. So these are the alternate investments that you can learn how they work by opening the account and putting in a small amount of money. And most of the places that I mentioned, uh, you could open an account with as little as like $500. Some might be a thousand. Either way, it's not a huge chunk of money. As I reflected on you know, my wealth journey and looking at my wealth stack, that, that was a huge piece of it. The willingness to open up new accounts and dabble, try out new things. Like I, I guess I've, I'm just a perpetual dab, da, dabbler in the sense like, man, I just, I wanna learn. It's exciting, it's fun, it's new. And also too, like, I mean, looking at cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, like I, I put a thousand dollars in and I'm glad that I did. You know, even as of right now with Bitcoin, I mean, almost down, gosh, almost 50% from its high, I think it's down about 45% from its high around 60,000. You know, I'm still up like 150 grand, I think, all because I dabbled and opened up that first account to put $1,000 in, then I put another 1,000, then 20,000, 30,000, and so on and so forth. And now I've got, you know, over, I think three or 400,000 currently invested into crypto altogether. So that has grown a lot all because I started that first alternative trading account. So that's number four. Number five, this is one of the ones that will take some time to get to. For those I mentioned, I had a quote from Robert Kiyosaki earlier. You know, he is uh, famous for his cash flow quadrant, where you start off as an employee, and then you go to self-employed, and then to business owner, and then to an investor. So with you know, his cash flow quadrant, one of the ways, once you get to self-employed or business owner, then you have the ability to open up a retirement account that is for your business that then allows you to put away more. So you think about if you have a 401k, it's your job. Yeah, you can put money away. But if you are a 1099 independent contractor or even better, you own your own business, you have the ability to open up your own 401k. And once again, like this is this is this is one of the ones that it's not going to happen overnight. And even in my self-employed business owner journey, I did not start with the 401k. I started, I mean I had the actually I had the Roth for the longest period of time. And then from there, I ended up opening a SEP IRA, and that is just a a, a type of retirement account that uh, you open up if you are self-employed. So I had that for a considerable considerable period of time. And I don't remember how much I put into the SEP. If you cap out, like you can put almost like 30 or 40 grand into a SEP IRA. I had that for a certain period of time. And then eventually I ended up going to a solo 401k. And as of right now, 
I have what's called a self-directed 401k with a profit sharing plan. And the reason being I have that is because my wife is also on my payroll. I don't have any other employees at this time. I used to have employees with my financial planning practice, but that has since been sold. So now I have this self-directed 401k. Now, what does self-directed mean? As I mentioned earlier with the Roth IRA and why I love the Roth over the 401k is because you have control in your choices, in the investments that you choose. So with a self-directed 401k, like one of the most appealing features of that is similar. You have that same control that you would have over the Roth. So with my self-directed 401k, I have uh, private real estate investments. I have an account with M1 Finance that uh, I bought some tech stocks like Tesla and Facebook and Google. Um, what else do I have? I, for a time, I still have a, an account with Lending Club, even though they have, you know, they changed their business model, so that money is, is coming out. But I had an account with Lending Club. I became an angel investor for the first time, and I was able to purchase that inside of my self-directed 401k. So that is one of the, the big benefits of the, the self-directed route. You gotta find somebody that's willing to, to set this up for you. They do exist a little bit harder. Uh, they do cost a little bit more. Either way though, that is what I have. And with having my wife on the payroll, you know, so right now we're putting in the max, which uh, I don't know what the time is recording. I think it's like 19,000, maybe 19,500 that we each can put in. So we're each putting that in plus with the profit sharing. So that basically means, you know, if the business is profitable, we can put in an additional amount so for the last several years, we've been able to put in about $110,000 pre-tax uh, so that we're able to deduct, deduct that you know, from our income into our self-directed 401k. That is huge. So as you can see, like this is a, a huge component of the wealth stack is to be able to fund that amount of money into a self-directed pre-tax 401k. Like that is a huge, huge one. Now that does not happen overnight. It takes time. Obviously you gotta have the business. You gotta have something that's making money. And then you gotta have the income from that business to be able to do that. But I didn't start there. Uh, I think I've only had the 401k probably for, I don't know exactly. I'm just gonna say like maybe eight years or so. So prior to that, it was the set. Prior to that, it was the Roth. It's all about baby steps, right? Start with the Roth. Eventually, once you have that business, you have the income, then you can have that self-directed 401k. So that is number five. Number six is asset protection. It's a huge one. This is the one that most people overlook, they don't care about, they don't think about it, it's not sexy, it's kind of boring. Asset protection, oh, it's whatever. Okay, so what, what are we talking about here? So, I mean, you have the basic stuff, right? Like auto, home, health. Essentially, we're talking about insurance. Remember the, the CYA fund? Cover your you know what. Cover your assets. You got to cover your assets. You can take that risk. And if something happens, you know, you only have like liability insurance, all of a sudden you get in a wreck and okay, you, you took care of the other person, but now you can't drive. So now you can't get to work or you can't do your business because you don't have a vehicle. That's going to hurt. Same thing with home insurance, health insurance. Like these are all essentials. A big one for myself, my family, my wife is life insurance. It's a big one. It's a huge one. Life insurance is something that I've, I obviously I had this when I was deployed to Iraq. You know, we had, this was something that we got to the military. I didn't have to pay for it. I think it was like $400,000 I had back then. When I got home, I took out a term policy and I think it was like around $250,000 that I took out. Uh, after we had our first kid, I upped that. After we had our second kid, I upped that. And right now I've got $2.5 million of just term insurance. You know, we have our auto, we have our home, we have our health. We also have an umbrella policy. Like I remember talking with a, oh, I forgot his official title, but he was like some sort of like wealth management advisor at the very first brokerage firm that I started with. And we were getting ready to meet with some wealthy clients of mine. So I, I brought him down from home office. It was kind of like a dog and pony show. Like, hey, I've got this guy, you know, he's a, a wealth management advisor, <laughs> something like that. But at the time, like I was so new to the business. So like, there was a lot of things that we were talking about that I didn't understand. 
I wasn't comfortable to talk about, you know, intelligently. Plus, I thought I'd bring in somebody, bring in a guy in who's probably like 10, 15 years older than me. It's going to make me look good. One of the things that he brought up to my clients that I've never forgot was, you know, we're talking about the different types of insurance, but he talked about umbrella insurance. And no, we're not talking about insurance to protect your umbrella in case it rains. Although that's the whole concept, right? So the, the whole concept of umbrella insurance is an umbrella policy is going to protect you for all the areas that you didn't get, you don't have protection on. So with your home insurance, with your auto insurance. And one of the things he mentioned to me is like, you know, if you were in a car accident and it was your fault and you've got a lot of assets and this person wants to come after you because they got hurt in a, in a bad way, this is where this umbrella policy can come into play to protect you. And the thing about the umbrella policy that was most fascinating was it's not a lot of money. I think for like at the time, like a million dollar umbrella policy was like a couple hundred dollars. Right now, I think we have a, it's, actually, I don't even know, <laughs> I gotta go double check with our records, but it's at least $2 million, if not $4 million of our umbrella policies. That is a huge one. One policy I currently don't have, but I did have for a good amount of time was a disability policy. That's the thing with asset protection is that it's going to change, it's going to evolve as your family changes, as your business changes, as your needs change. So there may be some policies that you don't have or you're not paying as much or the coverage isn't as much or you need more depending on where you're at in that. But the one that I would encourage you to look at is an umbrella policy, especially if, you, if you're dealing with a, uh, a life, in, not a life insurance agent, but your insurance agent that you already have your auto and your home already through that. Ask them about an umbrella policy to see how much it costs and to see how, uh, how much that would uh, provide you in coverage in case something happens. So anyway, check out the umbrella policy. That is number six. Number seven, this is the big one. This is the big one. This is the hard one. This is an IPA. And uh, yeah, okay. I, I do enjoy drinking a beer every once in a while. But actually, I don't like IPAs. So it's actually, we're going to expand this abbreviation. And it's actually going to be a SIPA a self-managed income producing asset. A self-managed income producing asset. This is the, the holy grail. You can, we're, we can call this passive income, although I know all you passive income people, freaks of nature out there, that want to argue. That's not passive income. You're doing work. You know, you're putting in two hours a month. So you don't, that's not passive. Okay. So if you want to sit here and argue about what is passive income and what isn't, but you aren't making any passive income whatsoever, then don't waste my time. Don't waste the community's time. Don't waste your time posting a comment that is pointless. You're wasting your time. So let's talk about a self-managed income producing asset. This could be real estate. It could be a dividend portfolio. It could be some sort of business, whether it be offline or online. For me, you know, my self-managed income producing asset is, is my website, the blog. Before that, it was also my financial planning practice before I sold it. And even still, it's, it's a self-managed income producing asset because I'm, the way that I structured, the way I sold my business is I get a check monthly uh, over a seven year period. And I think I still have five and a half, maybe four and a half years left of receiving this check. That's pretty sweet. With my blog, for those that don't know, goodfinancialsense.com is my blog. That is my self-managed income producing asset. So what does this mean self-managed? So this is where like passive income, it's not passive, you know, you're doing work. <laughs> you like my voice? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So with a self-managed income producing asset, the, the one requirement though at the beginning is that 
it ain't self-managed. You gotta put in the work. You gotta put in the hustle. You gotta put in the grind to make it work. With the financial planning practice, that was over a decade of working my tail off to get to the point where I am making really good money and not putting in a lot of work to maintain. That was one aspect. With the online business, with the blog, same thing. That was a ton of work. Blog started back in 2008 and wasn't until, wow, what year is it? 2021? Um, <laughs> 2015, where uh, it was making a substantial amount of money, where I could ponder selling the financial planning practice and then focusing on the business full time. So we're talking, I was like seven years. That took a lot of time, but self-managed. So yes, it does require some work. It does require some upkeep to keep the checks rolling in. But when I sit here and tell you, gosh, just to give you some examples, I, a more recent example is I, next week at the time it's recording, I just bought tickets to a Cardinal Atlanta Braves game down in Atlanta. I'm taking my three older boys. Uh, we're leaving Friday and uh, we're only staying one night because we're coming back. And then the very next day we rented a boat and we're going boating with some uh, neighbors of ours. We're at the lake that we're going to somewhere here in the Nashville area. This was all booked and didn't even, Think about who's going to cover my shift. How am I going to make money while I'm gone? And it's because I have processes in place. I have a team in place that is taking care of majority of the heavy lifting that is required to keep that money coming in. At the beginning of next month in July, my family and I were going to the Dominican Republic for, I believe it's seven days. We're going with some, actually some of the same families. It's booked. I don't have to think about, man, how do I get time off? What do I need to do to make sure that I've got money coming in while we're gone? That's not even a concern. The money is is coming in. I'll rewind a little bit. Uh, one of the first, one of the first major trips that I took. Major in a sense, because it was a two week trip. Uh, my family and I, this is before we adopted our daughter, we rented an RV and it was a two week family RV trip and took that trip, booked that trip and the money still came in. That is the power of a self managed income producing asset. This ain't a J-O-B, this ain't a nine to five. You know, this is not a, even like a sales business where I've got to make sales calls in order to get paid. You know, I have set up an asset that without me having to clock in, clock out, make a call, set up a conference call, set up a meeting, do anything, it is going to get me paid. It is going to pay me. And in this case, you know, in my case, it pays me very well, pays me amazingly well. This is the holy grail. This is the thing to work towards, to get towards. And this is that final key component of the wealth stack. You can start on this one. You can start dabbling to see if you can begin this self-managed income producing asset, but don't forget the first steps. Don't forget the CYA fund. Don't forget the Roth IRA. Don't forget the personal equity fund because all of those had a key part, a key contribution into what I have now with my SIPA. I gotta come up with a, <laughs> the, the SMIPA, <laughs> the IP, I like the IPA, that just sounds so much better. The IPA. Without those, I don't have that. Like I, I couldn't have started that without going through the, the these beginning stages. Like those were crucial, those were key. So I know many of us want shortcuts but a lot of these, you can start, man, you can start the CYA fund. You can start the Roth IRA. You can start the trading account, right? You can get to all those. And eventually when you have, you become self-employed, you can start the SEP IRA or the 401k, the solo 401k. Like these are all things that you can do. You can begin the asset protection, making sure that you got the right types of insurance, type, right types of coverage to protect your assets.
Those are all huge. Once you have all those, boom, you got the IPA. You can start, start that. And I'm gonna have a lot more content on this process, this concept of the self-managed income producing asset, because I think it's huge. It is huge. It is a game changer. It's been a game changer in my life. It's been a game changer in so many other people's lives that I have seen. So if you want more of that, you want to learn more of that, I think you know what to do. <laughs> Hit that subscribe button, like this video, this podcast, if you enjoyed this content. I've got more. I want to spend more time diving in and not just giving you general topical type of advice. I want to dive in and really show you what the journey has looked like and not all the pretty stuff. Not everything has smelt like roses, 100% pun intended, by the way. Not everything has smelt like roses along the way. There's been a lot of stuff that's been pretty stanky, if I'm being honest. But man, I, I am grateful for those experiences. I'm grateful for those fail failures that end up becoming amazing life and business lessons because without those, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. All right, y'all. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, subscribe, share with somebody that needs to hear more about this wealth stack and this concept so they can begin their wealth building journey. Until next time, this is Jeff Rose reminding you that it's your money, it's your life, and only you can make it awesome. Until then, peace.